Thank you all for joining. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to day two of Next. I know you all have busy schedules, so I appreciate you spending the next 45 minutes with us. So what are we talking about today? To do that, I just want to do a quick show of hands. Um, how many of you in this room do not know or have not heard of VPC service controls? OK, one. OK, there's a few. Um, that's good. Um, the reason for the question was to make sure how much of time I need to spend on the introduction. The, this, these sessions are being recorded, so uh, you know, I'd anyway do an introduction on the technology. But what you're going to do in the next 30 odd minutes is to deep dive into what VPC service controls, or as I now call it, VPC SE is, uh, why it is one of the more popular security controls coming out of Google Cloud Stables, and how it is evolving. Then I'll hand the session off to Christian, Christian Gorke, uh, who is the vice president and head of Cyber Center of Excellence at Commerce Bank. He'll walk you through his, his bank's journey with VPC SE and how it provides a unique value proposition in data exfiltration. So about me, uh, my name is Sriram Balasubramanian. I go by Sri. Um, I am a senior product manager here at Google. And um, as you begin this session, I want to start off with a quick congratulations to everybody in the room. The folks in the room are here because you're all highly attuned to the risks of data exfiltration and the challenges encountered in securing data. I shouldn't have to say this, but data exfiltration is a costly problem for almost all organizations. Uh, the reasons are many, but what is important to keep in mind is that data exfiltration happens not because of the absence of security controls. In fact, it happens in spite of strong controls because ultimately, misconfigurations can happen Vulnerable code continues to show up. Credentials get stolen or leaked. Now, to put an analogy into this, you know, when you have, with your vehicle, you have a co collection of safety controls. But among all of this, one way to think of what a data exfiltration control is, is like a child lock for a car door. You know, just as you want your precious commodities, in this case, probably your kids or anybody else who are in the back seat, you want to control when they leave the vehicle, you similarly want to have controls around how and when data goes out of your organization. This will ensure uh, that data doesn't just leave an organization in the event of a compromise caused by one of these factors. I'm sure you've all heard of the well-known stories of defense in depth and security, layers of onion, so on and so forth. At Google, we believe security is a shared responsibility and we follow a shared responsibility model here. We work to secure our networks and our infrastructure, and our goal is to provide customers the tools necessary to do so on your own projects at many various levels of the network stack, whether it's from an infrastructure perspective, networking perspective, identity perspective, internet-facing application perspective, and so on and so forth. However, when building a stack, and we realized this um, two, three years ago, that most organizations have a challenge when it comes to defending against exfiltration. You know, the problem is typically addressed by making a determination to go off internet um, and use tools like CASB, secure web proxies, or other proxies for any internet access um, and even have controlled access there. However, if there is an attack vector that is targeting your multi-tenant cloud-delivered services, it is extremely hard to use a secure web pro proxy or even go off internet and use that as a vehicle to prevent that. Primarily because it is almost impossible to separate what is legitimate access versus what is an exfil attempt. You can, at that point, only be as secure as your credentials or configuration is. This is the problem that VPC service controls aims to solve. It aims to provide you for uh, Google multi-cloud uh, APIs or services, API level exfiltration controls. In 
To put it simply, and I'm going to throw a few buzzwords here, um, VPC service controls is a zero trust based, cloud first security centric model for preventing data exfiltration from multi-tenant Google services. It does this not by being part of either network identity or device controls, but operate as an overlay on top of all these boundaries and working in conjunction with other security controls. As I mentioned to you, API-based exfiltration is the most common way by which bulk data exfiltration happens in organizations. So it functions by controlling and restricting API communication for Google managed services across the three paths for service access, which is internet to service, other VPC networks to the service, and service to service. How it does this at its basic level is it operates by creating an abstract boundary around the group of resources and services that you want to protect. We call this a VPC SE perimeter. Once created, resources within the perimeter are free to talk to each other. However, all API access that spans perimeter boundaries gets blocked. In such a scenario, any credential theft misconfiguration that could allow data movement across the perimeter is rejected by VPC SE. We, however, realize that this kind of a binary state of allow inside the perimeter and denied outside the perimeter might be too restrictive for legitimate access paths. To support that, we built into VPC SE what we call directional rules that allow you to explicitly permit the flow of APIs for a particular service in either direction, from outside the perimeter to inside, or from inside to outside. These rules are very powerful and allow you to ensure granular, granular least privilege access to your services. Uh, please keep in mind, you don't use VPC SE and then say, oh, I don't need my firewalls anymore. This works in conjunction. It focuses on a particular threat vector, and it does its job very well. Now, how do we make this happen? What are the building blocks for VPC SE? Uh, first, and, and I think there's a step that I did not mention in the slide is, First, I, I, you need to sit with your teams and figure out where your sensitive data is. In most cases, you'll probably start with um, a BigQuery data set, a GCS bucket, or a collection of buckets, but identify which data sets you are worried about leaving your environment. Once you identify that, identify the set of resources and services that are connected to that that you want to protect. You could define these uh, as projects and or VPC networks. You then create an abstract perimeter. A perimeter is just an abstraction. It's not something that's uh, set in stone. It's an, abstract set it's an ab abstract boundary that you create around all these projects and services. Once you create this perimeter, the next step is to figure out which services you want to restrict in the perimeter. Those are the only services that will be restricted by VPC SE. My recommendation here is to read what we publish in uh, google.com called supported services uh, uh, document or our supported services page around VPC SE before you start to roll it out. This is important because what is unique about VPC SE is not only does it restrict what we call visible access paths where a particular user or a workload access a service, it also controls service to service access paths if we perceive that that could be a way by which data can be extracted from a perimeter. So what it is, this would mean is for services, it would, in, it would create additional restrictions on how a particular service can be used with the goal of threat exfiltration prevention in mind. Now, there is a next step called VPC accessible services. I'll skip it for a moment uh, and I'll come back to it. Now, beyond that, that's when you, you have to decide once this perimeter is created, are there legitimate access flows that I need to permit? And that's where our directional rules come into play. These directional rules are extremely granular. You can restrict it at an individual identity, an identity and a network, or just a network based on locations, and so on and so forth. And on the other side, when the service itself is being accessed, you can either broadly allow or deny access to a service or a group of services, or you can get more granular and say, for this service, I will only allow these methods to be accessed. This will ensure that truly any access is controlled by you, Irrespect, and you can still have administrative pro permissions for the project handed off to the project uh, owner. Uh, so this allows the security team to provide this overlay umbrella protection against exfiltration. Now finally, before you roll it out, 
we have what is called a dry run mode in VPCAC, which essentially turns on the controls, but operates in a log only mode. So putting your service in dry run mode and watching traffic flows and violations over a period of time will allow you to decide what violations are legitimate violations that you'd want to block and what violations are not legitimate that could lead to business impact that you want to allow by adding an additional rule. So my recommendation is whenever you create a VPCAC policy or whenever you make changes to the policy, use the dry run mode. Going back to VPC accessible services. We have, in many conversations with customers, uh, the security teams want to be much more prescriptive with, in terms of what workloads and resources within a VPC can even access. That is what VPC accessible services does. Because when you create a perimeter, obviously there is free conversations within a perimeter, and there is, if you have a policy, a workload within the perimeter can access services outside the perimeter. VPC accessible services provides an additional layer of control and restriction that you can take advantage of. Finally, you can move to enforce mode and uh, you should be protected. Lo lots of interesting questions come here when you talk about this. How do I decide how big my perimeter is? Do I need to build this perimeter at an organization level? Do I need to build this at a, at a project level? Uh, do I have to combine a bunch of projects together? Um, there is no one answer to this. What I have seen is customers either primarily, they operate in one of three models. Either they have one perimeter across all their organization and ensure that all projects, whenever they are created, are part of this perimeter. The idea here is I am worried about external threats that's outside my GCP organization and I want to protect it. Then there are customers who have strict policies around cross-functional conversation. So, you know, my dev environment should not talk to my prod environment. There we see this multi-perimeter model. Then the third group of customers who don't want strict restrictions but want to protect their critical data sets create small perimeters around their critical data sets to just protect access to it. Uh, these are the three common models seen. There are more in between and, and around it. But um, as I mentioned, VPC SEs Capabilities don't stop with the ingress egress rules. Within these rules, as well as outside of the rules, you can leverage our context-aware access capabilities to create access control based on non-network, non-identity attributes, particularly based on uh, sustaining attributes like session time or time in general, identity, uh, IP address, and more importantly, device-based attributes, like whether an X509 cert certificate is present on the device or not. We, re we require Beyond Corp, the Beyond Corp Enterprise product or Beyond Pro Corp Essentials product to be available for you to do this. Um, so that's my quick overview on VPC SE. Before I leave, I do want to give you a quick view on what we have and what's coming. VPCSE's roadmap is, road, is, is robust, and I feel like I've talked a lot already, but uh, this is interesting. Um, we decided when we looked at VPCSE that our roadmap should cover multiple pillars because there is needs across multiple pillars. The first one is scale, and as you can see from the numbers here, we have seen VPCSE being used and used as a default security control in a large number of customers. So we have asks anyway from supporting you know, 5,000 perimeters to 20,000 projects um, in a perimeter. So our environment is now scaled to 40,000 resources, 10,000 perimeters, 10,000 policies. Um, and we also have a way to scale out uh, through uh, a capability called scope policies. The next function is around how specific or granular you can be with your ingress egress rules, which is how you allow access into the perimeter. Uh, you can define these rules based on VPC networks, and what we are announcing in preview is the ability to use your private IP addresses to extend VPC SE network protections and allow for controlled access to your GCP services from on-premise. Prior to this, for any of your on-prem resources, you just have a landing zone VLAN, and you, that VLAN, if it's part of the perimeter, it's free range for on-prem. You, you don't need to do that anymore. Of course, we did uh, work on flexibility as well, which is how you define a perimeter, and we extended what you can use to define perimeters to include VPC networks too. Uh, finally, uh, ease of management is critical. 
delegated administration that we have come up with so that you can distribute management of your perimeters itself in large environments. And finally, what is VPC service controls but protection for Google services? So it is imperative that Google services adopt it for you to see true value out of it. We are 85%, I think we are close to 90% coverage as of Q223. And we have mandated that any new service coming out of Google stable will support VPC, SES, GA with a star there that says conditions apply. <sighs> I think uh, I've spoken enough. I'd like to welcome, welcome Christian on stage to talk about his experience with VPCAC and the tenants that he's using. Christian, welcome. Thank you very much, Sri, for the... Thank you very much, Sri, for the, for the uh, uh, introduction of VPC service controls and also on the roadmap on the features next to come presented from uh, or provided by Google. And now, let's switch over a little bit to a dialogue with Comets Bank. So as we said, who am I? I'm Christian Gorke, head of Cyber Center of Excellence from Comets Bank. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Comets Bank before we are switching over back to VPC service controls and how we are leveraging VPC service controls. So first of all, who is Comets Bank? Comets Bank is the leading bank for the German Mittelstand, meaning we're having uh, around 26,000 corporate clients and uh, roughly 11 million private and small business customers. So this is also um, the reason why we have a client-focused portfolio. We, have, we are separated into these two categories, private and small business customers, as well as corporate clients. Then what you see in the, in the center, we have a focused business model uh, uh, comprised of five points. First is personal advisory offering, meaning we see the customer as the main focus point, so we want to be the personal partner for our customers. Second, consistent customer focus. This means customers' demands are changing and we need to put the here again the customer first in order to um, provide the right services to the customer. Third, comprehensive uh, digitalization means that we are constantly evolving to become and provide better, faster, and more um, advanced products in a digital portfolio. Fourth is uh, profitability before growth, so focus totally on the, on, the, on the customer demands. And last but not least, sustainability, which includes both um, sustainable products, financial products, as well as helping customers to achieve their sustainable transformation. Now this is Comets Bank, and within Comets Bank, uh, there's a division, a key area, which is called Big Data and Advanced Analytics. And before I talk to you what we are exactly doing there, I want to give you some, some, some numbers. First of all, we are roughly 500 uh, people uh, distributed across four countries. Um, interesting is that we were the first business area of Comets Bank in the public cloud. And uh, when we work with other key areas in the bank, we actually get a very good rating from the others. So meaning what we are doing is probably quite, quite, quite good. And an interesting fact that I want to share, especially with this audience, is um, we drive a certain kind of innovation. And one point of this innovation is that we actually um, contribute towards um, Google Cloud's repository, code repository. So we did, I guess, a hat trick last year and this year again, con contribute multiple times to the source code. So if you use containers on Google Cloud or do anything with security on Google Cloud, there's a chance that there's somewhere some part of Commerce Bank running in it. And so on, on a more factual basis, what is BDA doing? Doing big data and advanced analytics. So we are creating value from data, meaning we are gathering, very highly speaking, the data of the bank. And then we are providing analytics services on top of it and offer both as a product or service. So for example, um, two use cases. Uh, one is um, electronic self-disclosure. So meaning automated um, scanning and machine learning algorithms applied to transaction data. And the second use case is what we call press for today. So this is more like looking at the uh, overall global available news and then connecting these news with our corporate clients. Now back to me. Uh, I'm heading as the Cyber Center of Excellence and our vision is to foster a secure, scalable and standardized public cloud, create the infrastructure and framework to become a cloud first business. Um, we are responsible in BDA for data protection, information security and cloud. And the important part for now, of course, is uh, information security and, and, and cloud. And within cloud, we are helping the bank, the bank's use cases to transition into the cloud, to land into the cloud. Um, we help engineering, we help uh, with the architecture. Um, we also do product development, which we call the cloud enterprise suite, because we can make the cloud very secure, but our goal is not only to make the cloud secure, but also trustworthy. 
Uh, and last but not least, we are also doing uh, knowledge sharing. We call it E equals MC squared. So this means excitement equals multiplication of knowledge times um, culture times curiosity. Because, you know, we don't only want to talk about cloud, we also want everyone we are talking to to also experience cloud and to learn why cloud would help them to achieve their, their, their business goals. Okay, now we have learned about Comets Bank and now back to VPC service controls. Before we introduce service, VPC service controls on our roadmap there too, we actually had five questions. And I want to explain to you how we answered these five questions. Um, the first question that I want to show to you is, when bringing organizations and applications to the cloud, which threat, threat vectors shifted with a high impact? And actually, uh, if you look at it and you move to the cloud, one thing that changes drastically is the model of the shared responsibility or shared fate, meaning the services the customer is taking care of is by it reduced to actually the data and the applications of the cloud service customer. And the cloud service provider is taking care of, let's say, the data center, of the cables, and of the lower level management. And you can shift this up to a maximum where the customer is only dealing with applications, data, and maybe its processes. So this means that the threat landscape moves completely to data and applications. Second point, the data transmission um, is completely handled differently than on-prem. So if you compare what you most likely know from on-prem is imagine you have a house and in this house you have a lot of rooms. If you want to go from one room to another room or from one room in one house to another room in another house, you need a lot of keys, you need to know where to go. Now if you compare this to cloud, cloud is completely different. Cloud works like this room here. It's a large room and actually everyone can talk to anyone. I just need to ask you, hey, can I talk to you? Is the user yes or no? And that's it. And no one else is, is, is stopping me. So the question is now, okay, data transmission. You have to think about how do we secure this? How does data movement actually is, is, is controlled? And so this is an inher inherent question we need to ask and we need to resolve. And the resolve, uh, result was that we actually have seen a 10 times increase of importance of, of IAM controls. And, but IAM controls isn't enough because you can control IAM, but can you control where your data flows? Do you want to control that your data, or do we want to see your data, data moving anywhere? Of course not. So this boils down to data exfiltration prevention. Where data exfiltration means your data is moving from your assets to external assets, and lateral data movement means that your data is uncontrolled flowing within your organization. And actually, we, we, we don't want any of that. Now, knowing this, the second question was, what are your main security requirements when selecting a cloud service? So now we have learned, okay, um, which, how did the threat model change? But how do we select now the right services on Google Cloud? Well, we build a model for that. And um, we first start with the security foundations. And as we are a string, strongly regulated company in Germany, in Europe, underlying multiple regulations, local regulations, in-house regulations, Europe regulations, there's a lot coming together telling us what to do and especially what not to do. And these are external drivers. We also have internal drivers, which come from uh, different setups, from organizational requirements, which again define the internal standards on security. And if we take both together, you actually get as output the system security requirements. And system here is just the Google Cloud. And now we know we have security guidelines, we have security measurements, and now we need to know how to steer the Google Cloud. But this is very generic. How do you map it like a very generic model to specific things like, let's say, Google Cloud Storage or VPC service controls? There is no mapping. And so we built a mapping. We call it the Cloud Service Security Assessment. And so for each service that the cloud, Google Cloud is offering, we're actually evaluate, evaluating a series of security features. For example, we want to see if the data can be encrypted with our key, customer managed encryption keys. We want to make sure that the data stays in Europe, so we need to have a geo regionalization uh, applied to it. We want to see that um, the services that, that Google is offering to, to, for us are actually certified in the sense that there's a certification from ISO 27001 or BSIC5 or other equivalent standards. And after that, as an outcome, we get this matrix that you see here on the, on the bottom right part of the, of the slide. So the, your lines are your services and your columns are all the, 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 the security requirements that we apply. 
And then on the right hand, bottom side, as an outcome, you get um, the cloud service secure configuration. So for each service that was now whitelisted, we also need to define how to use the service. Just because you know cloud storage is secure doesn't mean that everyone knows how to use cloud storage securely. Yeah, because I can just create a, a cloud storage and cloud storage supports customer managed encryption keys. But this doesn't mean that every bucket that I create will immediately have a cloud managed encryption key. So that's why we need both. Now, next question, how do we protect our cloud, Google Cloud workloads against data exfiltration threats? So we have learned about data exfiltration and we have learned about the Google Cloud services. Next is how do we protect them? And first, let me share with you a very interesting fact. So if you move into cloud and you use a lot of Google Cloud uh, native services like um, Cloud Storage, BigQuery, PubSub, you name it, actually one thing you will, uh, you will encounter is the more you use stuff on Google Cloud, the less you will deal with IP addresses or your, the, all the IP stuff will come in transparent for you. It just, it's, it's, it's happened mag magically by, by Google in the background. And uh, we did a survey on, on all of the BDA Google Cloud resources on the cloud and actually over 90% of all our services that we are using across all use cases um, leverage API communication only. So meaning there are no IP addresses used and as a result, is that all the traditional and classical security that we have built over the years for managing IP addresses, securing IP addresses, suddenly doesn't apply anymore. So meaning we have two results. The first one is all the firewalls, as we mentioned, the firewalls are still important for the other 10%, but for the 90%, we cannot apply it. And for this 90%, we need a new model, a new threat model, how to think about how can we secure our workloads on Google Cloud. And now I, I talked a lot about how to secure it, but what are we exactly uh, securing against? So I talked about data exfiltration, and this slide shouldn't scare you, but I want to show you how you can exfiltrate data from your organization like within seconds. So in the first step, what you need to do, you need to have an employee who can read some data. So he's part of your organization, and he's part of the good project, of the green project. And he gets read access to data. This is totally usual. This is part of every organization because otherwise you can't process the data. But now what is happening in the second step, this same employee in his free time back at home just creates another Google Cloud project. No one is going to stop him. And well on this project, what he's doing in this in the, is, is he's just, I mean he's an owner of the project obviously when he's created it, but he has write permissions on the evil project outside the organization. On the left hand side he has read permissions. And all he's doing is just using GSUtil, copy, um, left bucket, right bucket, and that's it. So three easy steps to exfiltrate the data. And this is not what we want to have. We need a tool in order to make sure that we control how the data is flowed, how the data flows. And this is, of course, where we come to VPC service controls. And here I've listed some reasons why we went for VPC service controls. So you can, I mean, to, to, to name one, one term, how you can imagine VPC service controls is like a, like a zero trust API firewall. It is much more than that, but um, maybe it's, it's easy to, to imagine something like this. You have organization administrators who are responsible for making sure that this setup is only controlled by the organization admins. It is not under control by the use cases. It is based on identities and services, and it is cut into parameters, parameter bridges, and access levels. Parameters, you can imagine like, is one project is one parameter and with all the settings, who can access, who cannot access as part of a parameter. If two use cases want to speak to each other, you need a parameter bridge. And the functional properties um, actually are, well, now suddenly we can control our access to the Google APIs. Because we have this parameter boundary around the services, around identities, around projects. And so we have a very fine-grained fine uh, access model for all our data, for all our assets. And yeah, the only thing uh, left on the list, which is important to think about, is that it's non-transitive. What does this mean? This means if I grant uh, three access to my buckets and three grants access to some of his friends, access to his bucket, his friends don't have access to my bucket. So I need, everyone who needs access to my budget bucket needs to explicitly ask me. So this then, in the end, leads to the VPC ERC standard architecture that we've established. Uh, and it consists actually of four elements, four easy to understand elements. The first one is, 
So and these elements, each element of this talks about data transfer. When I'm talking about data transfer, I of course mean controlled data transfer. The first one is we want to make sure that no data leaves Comets Bank's environment. The second point is we want to make sure that no one from outside of Comets Bank can access the data inside of Comets Bank. These are maybe the obvious ones. But now even inside of Comets Bank, we want to make sure that use case one cannot share data with use case B without permission. So there's no, no, no bleeding, no overlap between the use cases. And the third thing, uh, here on this slide, fourth thing, is you even want to uh, control the data flow between stages within a single use cases. So as an example, um, we have a developer, and this developer is a very good developer, it's the best developer we have in Comets Bank, and he's developing a new cool business product in dev. And he says, well, I need, I need productive data in order to see that my, my tool is working. And if you don't have a VPC standard, uh, standard architecture in place, this developer in dev will have access to, to production workloads because he can just you know, copy it as I said, just as one, one command. So we need to make sure that this, this developer gets of course its own test, test data, but on the other hand, what is still more important, does not have access to productive data. And so the VPC SE standard architecture greatly reduces um, the threat surface and establishes automated control. This is fully automated. It is a zero trust architecture and um, we have validated it multiple times with several um, security experts as well as from, also from Google. And as far as I know, to the best of my knowledge, we were the first uh, financial institute rolling out the security architecture back in 2020. So you can say, why are we using VPC service, service controls? We're using for three reasons. One is as a data exfiltration uh, mitigation. Second is to control the data flow, the data sharing. And third is to build environments. Next question, um, given your VPC service control standard that you've seen right now, how do you monitor violations and general usage of the standard? This is actually quite easy. We have two dashboards. The dashboard on the left with Lucas Studio, we are monitoring the VPC SE effectiveness. So we see how many violations we have, which kind of violations, against which services, against which projects, from which country. And then we are evaluating this together with our SOC team. On the right hand side, you see actually within cloud monitoring, we are monitoring the VPC SE limits and quotas. So when, when uh, here we see how many um, parameters we have on, on Google Cloud, and the more red you see here, the more I will call Sri's number and tell him, hey, please scale more. And so this is how we make sure on the left-hand side that the service is working correctly. We can track it, and on the right-hand side, we see how much we grow into, into Google Cloud. And this brings me to my last question, which is maybe the most important one for, for you as an audience here. How can other Google Cloud customers achieve the same high level of data exfiltration mitigation as we do? And of course, there's no one fits all answer, but first thing that you need to do is you need to build a vision. So what are you trying to achieve? Do you want to have cloud for cloud? Do you, do you use the cloud actually for cloud workloads or do you use the cloud for on-prem workloads? How do you secure your data workflow? Do you implement zero trust? And if you have, when you have established this vision, the next step is what do you need to actually bring this vision to life? Do you need executive sponsoring? Do you need security experts? Do you need cloud experts? Who do you need to involve in general? And after you have placed your vision and mission, the next goes towards process and technology. So the question is, um, how much have you matured into the cloud already? How many of your workloads are cloud native? Which workloads do you need to secure? And how do you embed the VPC service control into your organization? You have probably a lot of projects, a lot of services. How do you make sure that all of these are covered by the, by the security standards? And last but not least, but often the most important part is the people. So how do you make sure that that is clear who owns the standardization? So I just showed you our standardization. How do you make sure it is correctly implemented? How do you make sure there's an owner who, who drives the standard? How do you control the monitoring? And last but not least, how do you share knowledge? How do you make sure that this, this does not feel as a burden to your organization, but it feels actually, actually as an enabler for your company? And after you have answered these questions, then it's on you to, of course, implement it and hopefully have a more secure security posture on Google Cloud. 
This brings me to the end of the comments bank part for VPC service controls. And thank you for your attention. I will now hand over back to three.